binary search trees. In this last of two videos on binary search trees, we now look at some properties of these trees. Uh, in particular, we look at the property of a tree to be complete, to be a full binary tree. And these are necessary properties so that we can talk about the maximum depth of a complete tree of size M. Finally, we look at methods for adding and removing elements to a binary tree. First, let's um, review some of the concepts that were introduced in the last lecture. So a tree is a hierarchical data structure, can be implemented with link nodes. We've seen that there are two categories of methods. There are those that are easy to implement using iterative methods, and there are methods that are easier to implement using recursive methods. In both cases, the implementation of recursive method is simple. So here, the methods that are easy to implement without recursion are the methods where we're visiting one and only one path in the tree. They can, in, they can easily be implemented using an iterative method. And the case that we looked at was the method contains. So here, what I mean by one path is that we start at the root, we compare the value of interest with the value of the current node, and we make a decision. Let's say I need to go right. We now look at the current node, compare with some element to be added, for instance, make a decision. Shall we go left or right? Let's say we need to go left. Each time we go down the tree by one level, we're making a series of decisions and we never revisit these choices we've been following a single path inside the tree structure. These methods are easy to implement with iterative approaches. On the other hand, the methods that are traversing more than one subtree for a node. Imagine that you want to implement a method to calculate the size of the tree. In order to calculate the size of the tree, you will have to count the number of elements to the left and count the number of elements to the right. And this will be done recursively in order to count the number of elements for a node. We need to count the number of elements to its left, count the number of elements to it's right. This process will be performed recursively in a very natural fashion. However, if you were to try to do the same thing without writing a recursive method, this, will, this would be more challenging. Furthermore, the code that uh, we're implementing on recursive methods will also be quite efficient, will not cause major issues in terms of memory. And this is actually the, the main topic of the day. We're going to be interested in talking about the maximum depth of a binary search tree. And that's going to be important because the maximum depth of a binary search tree will also be the maximum size of the call stack. So the binary search tree is a tree such that all the keys to the left of a given node are strictly smaller than the value stored in the current node. And all the keys that are stored in the right subtree of this node are strictly larger than the key that is stored in the current node. We've seen that we can easily implement the binary search tree using link nodes. 
it was important that these nodes would contain values having a compare to method that's necessary to do the routing in the tree. So we're using a public static class node to create the structure of this tree. The values are comparable and a node has a left and a right subtree. The node that's the most accessible, the one that we can access from the binary search tree object is a node that's designated by root, the root of the binary search tree. Here's a memory diagram for a binary search tree that contains only one node. So here to the left, we have the binary search tree object. It has its instance variable root. Here is an object of the class node. An object of the class node has an instance variable value. The values are comparable. A node also has a left and right subtree, has instance variables left and right. In the case of a leaf, such as this node, left and right are null. This is the memory diagram for a tree that contains one, two, three, four, five values. Okay, as I said in the introduction, the main goal of our lecture today is to say something formal about the maximum depth of a binary search tree. First, let's define a full binary tree. In computer science, we say that a binary tree is full if all its nodes contain exactly two children except for the leaves. So here we have a tree where we see that 8, 5, and 15 have two descendants. Otherwise, the nodes 2, 7, 12, and 29 are leaves. They have no descendant. Such tree is called a full binary tree. Another interesting property is the property of a tree to be complete. So we say that a tree of depth D is complete if all the nodes that are at depth less than D minus one, so from level zero all the way to D minus two, have exactly two children. What is it that we're trying to say? We're saying that the nodes that do not have two children are located on the last two layers of the tree. That's what we're saying. Everything above, these nodes have exactly two descendants. Those that do not have two descendants are located in the last two nodes. So the tree here is indeed complete because the nodes that do not have two descendants are located on the last two levels of the tree. On the other hand here, this particular tree has a node 5, which is a leaf, does not have two descendants, and yet it is not located on the last two levels of the tree. So this tree is not a complete tree. And this definition is useful so that we can talk about the maximum depth of a binary search tree. So if the tree is complete, we can show that for a tree of depth D, the number of nodes in the tree will be in between 
2 to the power d and 2 to the power d plus 1 minus 1. Let me show you what this looks like. So here we have a, to the left a tree that has four levels and to the right we also have a tree that has four levels. To the left I have a tree that has four levels and I'm showing you the tree that has the least number of elements. It has the least number of elements because there's only one leaf at level four. In this case there are two to the power d, so here two to the power four elements. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. To the right, I have the, the tree that has the maximum number of elements for a tree of depth 4. It has the maximum number of elements because the last level or at the level d minus 1, all of my nodes have exactly two descendants this level D is full. In this case, there are 2 to the power D plus 1 minus 1 element. It's easy to see that. If I were to add a leaf here, it would have 2 to the power of 5 elements, which is 32. And now because this is not there, we remove 1, so we have 31 elements. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Okay, so 2 to the power d plus 1 minus 1. Okay, so for level d, the minimum is 2 to the power d, and the maximum is this. So here, this is the total number of nodes n. So n is equals to 2 to the power d, lower bound. If we take, if we want to know what's d, we will take the log base 2 on both sides of this equation. So d is equals to the log base 2 of n. So this is telling us what is d if I have n elements then the maximum depth is going to be log base 2 of n. Okay, so we, we didn't have this discussion yet. We should be interested in talking about the efficiency of the various methods that we will be writing for a binary search tree as a relationship to its topology. So far, I cheated a little. I've showed you trees that were would look more or less as balanced tree, meaning trees that have equal weight on the left and right hand side. Here, to the right, you should convince yourself that this bizarre structure that we have is also a binary search tree. So to the left of 5, I have 2, and to the right, I only have keys that are larger. And if you look at each one of these nodes, they don't have any left child, but to the right, there are only keys that are larger than. These two trees actually contain the same elements, 2, 
5, 7, 8, 12, 15, 19. 2, 5, 7, 8, 12, 15, 29. There's actually a tree that is even more bizarre. It's this tree. It's still a binary search tree. Every node has this property that the elements to the left are smaller and the elements to the right are larger, except that it's a very degenerated case that we have to the right. On both cases, we have that um, the same elements. To the left, if I want to know if a value is found or not inside this tree structure, I will follow a maximum of two links because that's the maximum depth of this tree. To the right, I could follow all the way to one, two, three, four, five, six links and to the minus one links because it's a linear structure that we have to the right, to the left, we have a tree structure. What makes binary search tree efficient is because every time we're making a decision, we're eliminating one subtree. We're eliminating half of the search space. This is the same strategy that you have when you're doing a binary um, search tree comparison. You're eliminating half of the uh, search tree. So here, the maximum number of nodes visited is the depth of the tree. If your tree is complete, it's very advantageous. The maximum depth will be log base 2 of n. Here I'm showing you a table where you see several powers of 10 and to the right, the log of that number. Okay, so to the left, we have various values of n and to the right, we have the log base 2 of n. So what this is telling us is if I have a tree that has 1 billion elements, its maximum depth, if the tree is, is uh, complete, will be 29, a very small number. So with 29 comparisons, we will, at maximum, we will be able to determine if a value is found in the tree or not. Here I'm showing you various prefix, so mega, giga, tera, etc. to talk a little bit about real-world data. So currently in 2020, society is producing each day hundreds of exabytes of data. If we were to take the entire amount of information produced by society in a day, store this information in a, in a binary search tree, the maximum depth of the tree, if it's complete tree, would be 59, a very, very small number. The total amount in a, that of information that society has produced so far is expressed in zettabyte and zettabyte is 10 to the power 21. If we were to store 10 to the power 21 keys in a complete binary search tree, the maximum depth of this tree would be 69, a very, very small number. This is the maximum number of comparisons that are needed in order to determine if a key is found in the tree or not. I did some experiment just to, to give you a feeling for how fast this can be. So I use a computer with 64 cores, but I, only, I, I used only one core. These are somewhat modest Xeon processors. But this is a machine that has quite a bit of RAM, 512 gigabyte of RAM. 
what I did is I inserted a 1 billion, 10 to the power 9 elements inside this tree. It actually took me 3.13 hours to build the tree. And now I did five runs and on average it's taking me 5.765 microseconds to determine if a value is found inside this tree or not. So the time that it takes to determine if a value is found in the tree or not is actually 0 0.005765 milliseconds. This is ridiculously small. It's a very small amount of time to locate a key inside a tree that contains 1 billion elements. Actually, we didn't talk about a method add. We didn't talk at all about our strategy for adding information inside a tree structure. So let's do that right now. As I'm going to insert elements inside the tree, your job is to find the algorithm that I'm using. So I'm starting with a binary search tree and I'm inserting a line. So line will be the root of this binary search tree. I will now insert fox. The fox is smaller than, than the lion. I will insert it to the left. I'm inserting a rat. The rat is larger than the lion. You will have understood that I'm talking about the strings, the string lion and the strings rat. So I'm inserting rat to the right of lion. I'm now inserting cat. So cat is smaller than the lion, smaller than the fox. The cat is added to the left of the fox. I'm adding a pig. Pig is larger than the lion, but smaller than rat. The pig is inserted here. We're inserting dog. Dog is smaller than the lion, smaller than fox, but bigger than cat. Dog is inserted here. Finally, I'm inserting tiger. Lion, so the tiger is larger than the lion, larger than rat, tiger is inserted here. So, what was the algorithm that I used? Have we looked at an algorithm that looks something like this, that looks familiar to you? Did the structure of the tree changed when I was inserting element? Think about what would have been the worst order for inserting information inside this tree. What's the best strategy to insert information inside this tree? So if you need, make a little pause for the video and come back when you have the answers to all of these questions. So you're back. What would have been the worst order for inserting information inside this tree structure? It's obviously if the information has been given to me in order or in reverse order. If I had received cat first, cat would have been the root of the tree. Then dog, dog is larger than cat. Then I receive fox, fox is inserted to the right. Then I receive lion, lion would have been inserted to the right. Then rat, then, whoops, then pig. And pig, then rat, and then tiger. I could have received the information in the reverse order. So if I if first I received tiger, tiger would have been the root. 
Then I receive rat. Rat would have been inserted to the left of tiger. Then I receive pig. And you have the idea. So on, so forth. I would create a linear structure with cat being to the, the leftmost element of this tree structure. Okay, so here the structure is very unbalanced. It's a very degenerated tree if I receive the information in order or in the reverse order. What would be the best strategy for inserting information? If you imagine that the range of values is this line at the top, you want first to insert the middle element. What would be the next best choice? It would be the center element of the resulting two intervals. And recursively, we would be adding the center element for all the new intervals that are created. That would be the best strategy for creating a tree that would be balanced, where the weight of the left and the right subtrees are approximately the same. So here, what was the algorithm that I used to insert information? What algorithm do you know that looks very similar to the algorithm for adding information? Let's add a frog to our tree. Where would you add this new value? So frog is smaller than lion. So certainly I would go to the left of lion. Frog is larger than fox. If frog was found inside this tree structure, it would have to be to the right of fox. But the instance variable right of the node containing the value fox is null. We found the insertion point create a new node, make it current dot right, designating this new element. Okay, so this is very similar to the method contains. The idea is to locate where the element would be and to insert. We will always be replacing a, a null value by the reference of a newly created object. Okay, so I've selected here the method contains that's iterative. So what we're doing is, as long as we're not done and current is not null, let's compare the value of interest to current.value. If the value of the test is zero, element and current values are equals, there's no need to insert. If element is smaller than value, then we need to look in the left subtree. This is here where if current dot left is null, the element is not present and its natural place is to be the left child of current. So we would say current dot left equals new node to support this value. And in a very similar way, if the element is larger than current.value, we need to look in the right 
subtree. If current.write is null, this is the perfect place to insert the element. So if current.write is null, this is the place to insert the element. So current dot write will be equals to the reference of the newly created node. There is a special case, obviously. If the tree is null, if the ve instance variable value is null, this tree is empty. In order to make the insertion, we are not changing current.left or current.right of an existing node. We are changing the value of the instance variable root of this binary search tree. Okay, so there's a special case. If I initialized current to be designating root, and if current is null, then root will be pointing at the newly created node. Otherwise, as long as I'm not done, let's compare the element to be inserted with current.value. If we found it, we're done. If the result of the test says element is smaller than current.value, we go left. If current.left is null, this is the place where we should be inserting the element. Current.left equals new node, done equals true, so that we terminate. Otherwise, we have not found yet where the element should be inserted, but with respect to current.value, we know that we have to look in the left subtree. So current equals current dot right. On the other hand, if the result of this test says, no, 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 LM is larger than current dot value, then we have to look right. If current dot right is null, this is the place where the element is inserted. Current dot right equals new node, done equals true. But if current.write is not null, we know that element is larger than current.value. Let's look in the right subtree. And this is our method add for adding information into a binary search tree in ITI 1121. Okay, so we always replace a null value with any node. You see that the structure of the tree is unchanged. That would actually be a, an issue because there's no guarantee that the tree that will be produced will be a balanced tree or ideally a complete tree. When you will take the data structure course next year, you'll see some, some structures that are called auto-balanced tree, AVL trees, and these trees will have methods that are adapted so that when we're adding information to the tree, we're keeping their property of being a balanced tree. Okay, so here the topology of the tree does depend on the order in which the elements are added to the tree. And in ITI 1121, we will not do anything about this. We will let it be. Finally, our last topic is to look at a method remove. It's inevitable that removing an element will change the structure of the tree. Imagine removing the root of a tree will split the tree in two parts. So we're going to look at the various cases there are for the removal of an element. Our discussion will be very informal. In the lecture notes, you have the source code for the method remove. You actually have two implementations of it. However, our discussion will, will be at a high level, at an informal level, and yet it should be very insightful 
about the properties of binary search trees. So we're going to find different cases, cases that can be resolved easily. And then we will express the more complicated cases in terms of these simple cases. Look at the tree. We should agree that removing internal nodes, those with two descendants, such as four, two, 9, 6, 11. These are challenging cases. They're internal nodes. Removing them will be challenging. So we're left with nodes that are leaves and nodes with one descendant. Let's focus first on the case of removing a leaf. You will agree with me that it's it's trivial to remove a leaf. If I have a reference variable parent pointing at the parent of a leaf, in order to remove the leaf, I simply have to say parent dot write equals null in order to remove the right subtree or parent dot left equals null in order to remove the leaf that's to the left compared to the node designated by parent. Okay, so removing a leaf is easy. Okay, let's remove the drawings. The other case that's easy is the case of removing a node that has only one descendant. If I want to remove the node 7, so current, if current is designating the node 7, and that's the node to be removed, if my code has a variable called parent pointing at the parent node, then I simply need to write parent dot left equals to current dot right in order to remove so like this what's going to be very important in this entire discussion is that all the operations that we're perf performing on the tree they have to preserve the property that this is a binary search tree otherwise we're losing all the benefits the method contains can no longer be implemented in a time that's proportional to the maximum depth of this tree Okay, so here, removing a node with one descendant is easy. Okay, let's clear again the screen. Now I'm going to propose you two more cases where the removal is easy. I pretend that removing the smallest value of a tree or a subtree is easy. Do you see why? If you need to, you can pause the video and think about that. Why is it that removing the smallest value of a tree is easy. This is because the smallest value of a tree is located into the leftmost node. This element 
cannot have a left child makes sense if there was a left child the key stored in that node will would be smaller than current dot value so current was not designating the smallest value so the smallest value is located into the leftmost node and the leftmost node cannot have a left child there could be a right child okay so the leftmost node is a leaf or has a right child but we've already said that these are two cases that are easily solved it's easy to remove a leaf it's easy to remove a node that has only one child the other case that i pretend is easy to solve whoops i went one way one step too many so i'm clearing the screen again removing the largest value of a tree or similarly the largest value of a subtree is easy this time it should be obvious the largest value of a tree or a subtree is the rightmost node it's the rightmost because if this node had a right child the value that is stored in that node if the tree is a binary search tree the value would be larger so the node that i was pointing at was not containing the largest value okay so the largest value is found in the rightmost node of the tree and this node cannot have a right child therefore this node is a leaf or has a left child in both cases we said that it's easy to remove such node we're now ready to tackle our last case the case which is the most challenging the case of removing an internal node and for this let's take the example of removing the root of the tree okay the the work would be the same if we were to remove any of the other internal nodes if you need to make a pause of this video and think how can you remove the root in such a way that you preserve the property of this tree to be a binary search tree so for instance think about promoting one to be the root of this tree that doesn't make any sense I now have to the left keys that are larger than the root the resulting tree is not a binary search tree so that's not a good strategy what would be another strategy could be tempting to connect the left subtree underneath the leftmost node of my right subtree would be very tempting to do so because that would preserve the property of being a binary search tree this has a major drawback do you see it the major drawback would be that very rapidly this tree would have an unbalanced structure it would become very unbalanced very rapidly as we would be removing nodes the tree would look more like a linked list than a tree structure 
we would lose this property that finding an element is efficient. Okay, so again, that was not a good strategy. That was a dead end. Let me help you a little bit. Let the top diagram here represent the interval of all the values that are found in the left and the right subtree. If you were to promote only one value to become the new root, which one would that be? And there would be two choices for that. Let's first start by looking at the right subtree. If you were to promote only one value to be the new root of the tree, there's only one candidate that makes sense. It's the smallest of all the values that are in the right subtree. That's the only valid choice. Let's, let's write these values at, at the top here so that you can see better. So the values are 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. If you were to promote any other value than 7, then you would lose the property of being a binary search tree. You would have to the right of the root values that are smaller than. This tree would no longer be a binary search tree. So the smallest value of all the values that are larger than the root is the best choice. Furthermore, it's going to be easy to remove that element because it's the leftmost element. The smallest value of the right subtree is the leftmost value of the right subtree. This node will either be a leaf or a node that has a right subtree. And we've already concluded that it would be easy to do. So here we would remove 7. 8 becomes the left subtree of 9. 7 is our new root. There's a mirror strategy. If we actually were to consider the elements to the left of the root, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, there's only one element that can be prom promoted to become our new root. It's the largest of all the values to the left. It's the only one that will preserve the property of being a binary search tree. Any other values, take make the promotion of three here, it would mean that we would have four and five to the left of the root of this tree. This tree is no longer a binary search tree. So the only logical choice is to remove five. But five is the largest value of the left subtree of the root. If it's the largest value, then it's easy to remove. It's the rightmost element of the left tree, of the left subtree. Removing five will be efficient. Five cannot have a right child, otherwise it would not be the rightmost value. So we would remove five, it's a leaf, it becomes the new root. Okay, and that in a nutshell, that's the strategy for removing elements from the binary search tree. That's the strategy that I'm proposing you in ITI 1121. And that concludes our topic. That's the last 
method that we wanted to look at for ITI 1121. I'm showing you two implementations inside the lecture notes. So what we have seen about binary search trees is, is that there are efficient data structures such that for every node of the tree, all the keys located in the left subtree, these keys are strictly smaller than the key in the current node. All the keys that are located in the right subtree are strictly larger than the key that is stored in the current node. That is the important property so that we can efficiently search this data structure. So with that, I want, you, I want to wish you all the best for your final examinations. And that concludes ITI 1121.